everyone, my name is Eva Donesh and I am a third year pre-medical student at UCLA. And today I'm joined with Dr. Carlin. Dr. Carlin works at UCLA's Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Carlin, thank you so much for joining me here today. It's a pleasure being here with you today, Eva. This is a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit about your position at UCLA and what you do? Sure. So my name is Beth Carlin. I'm a gynecologic oncologist. So I take care of women who have cancers in their pelvis, so below the waist. Um, at UCLA, I am the vice chair for women's health research. And in the cancer center, I direct cancer population genetics. So as we've come to understand that cancer is due to dysregulation to genes that don't work normally, um, we're looking about at who's um, at increased risk for cancers and how to target those genes based on all the science we've, accom we've accumulated over these last decades. Awesome. So can you tell us what got you into this very specific field that can help so many women? Uh, so it goes back, I think so many things are just personal and what touches us. So my grandmother had breast cancer when I was 15 or 16 and then died of it. So I think I was always interested as um, a kid who, who liked science about what made a cancer cell different than a normal cell and wanted to understand that there were no physicians in my family. I only have sisters. Um, and really, as I got interested in that, I found a family friend who was a physician and um, he happened to work at a nearby hospital. I got to work at his research lab over a summer after my grandmother passed away. And that really sort of made me think about better understanding those basic differences might apply to ways to um, treat cancer better. And that's sort of what got me interested in, you know, thinking about this, this path forward. Um, in terms of women, um, you know, I do think women are the stronger sex, you know, women, um, had not had the same focus. Um, I know we're celebrating this month, you know, the anniversaries of Title IX. Um, I'm a pre-Title IX person. You know, we didn't have women's sports teams even. And I think I um, went through a number of classes um, as the only woman and sort of being told women can't do that. Um, my pediatrician, when I told him, I wanted to be a doctor, told my mother she can't do that. She'll take a job away from a man. Um, you know, so we've come a long way in those 50 plus years. And I think we still need to um, better balance the investment in women's health. I mean, we every cell has a sex. It either has an XX or an XY chromosome. And we can learn a lot that helps everybody by seeing um, how different things, how different cells react and how we can all work together. And how are you able to persevere when people like your pediatrician, who's a respected individual would tell you that this is like an impossible career for you to pursue? Yeah. Um, a passion, a fire to answer a question. Um, you don't need to make fights with anyone, but I think if you really believe and you really want to pursue those questions, I mean, there were lots of times, um, believe it or not, there was never a woman in G1 oncology at UCLA when I came. And when I interviewed, I was told it wasn't worth their time to train me because I was already married and I was going to have children and I was never going to last. And they want to train people who were going to stay in the field. And, you know, I finished my training in the eighties. So I've been doing this for way over three decades now and don't, think about retiring um, because there are questions, because there are questions I am burning to answer, questions that keep me up at night. Um, I made a quick comment earlier, and I didn't mean it to be such about women being the stronger sex, but as I see my patients try to balance their treatments with their family obligations, their work obligations, their financial obligations, and see the integrity and resilience that they have to bring forth. It just reminds me, I, you know, I always tell our trainees, I can't retire till we find the cures. 
because these patients need us and they need us to keep asking the questions. Never settle for what's good enough today, but always know we can do better for tomorrow. And um, every day is a chance for us to do better as an individual and to do better for the folks around us. And did this, you know, fiery drive and curiosity come from a parent, a mentor, or someone else in your childhood? You know, it's interesting. So many things um, come from striving for something that we didn't have handed to us. Um, I think it was, you know, wanting to know, I don't want to say the unknown, but yeah, a bit of, you know, I see what's in front of the page, and but this imagination of things that we could do better. Um, there were no physicians in my family. I would watch TV as a little girl and see a doctor TV show, and there were all male doctors there. And um, I'd imagine myself not as, again, nursing is an vitally, a vital partnership, and I have enormous respect for the many, many nurses who I work with, but I always imagined myself as the, on the doctor side. And, you know, um, maybe I went to snub my nose if people told me, you know, you can't do that, you know, you, you shouldn't go to that college, no one from here ever has, you shouldn't try this because no one's ever, you know, um, and just tried to put my be best foot forward. Um, do you know who Annie Oakley is? Yeah. Okay. So I always felt a little bit like Annie Oakley, you know, anything you can do, I can do better. <laughs> and so I kept um, working hard to prove that I deserved a seat at the table. And then when I got there, coupled that work ethic with gratitude that I was, I, I didn't resent it. I was really grateful to be in the room, to be able to voice a perspective from a different opinion that I felt in my heart was valid and could help bring things forward. Awesome. Um, and now today in 2020, when I think enrollment for females in medical school is even higher than that of males, uh, what would you say to any little girl, any girl in elementary school who has a little inkling for science, loves science, and you know might want to pursue this as a career? Um, it's an opportunity to have a drive, never get bored and continue to do it. Um, if you are a sibling, let's say an older sibling and you care for others, the reward you have from providing that care to someone um, fulfills you like nothing else. There are fringe benefits that cannot be counted in dollars because they um, bring you such purpose to continue to work and not burn out and continue to drive forward. I think as a little girl, um, dream. I know it's often hard and people have different situations, but believe in yourself, go for it. We used to say Nike it, that's probably, you know, these days, but just, you know, so just, just do it. Just sort of um, be, you know, when I say be polite, I'm not saying, you know, curtsy, but be respectful of others. Listen, you know, remember to listen to their perspectives too, but also believe that you bring something important with your voice. Um, you gotta love to work hard. I'll, I'd say that to a little girl. Um, you know, I'm not paying myself on the back, but I didn't get anywhere without really working hard. Um, people would at times have told me I'm a workaholic. Well, I don't know. I really like what I do and it doesn't make me sick. And, you know, so I, but that's why I don't want to retire. This to have a purpose driven life is, um, to me, you know, it's great. I, I have two kids. I'm married over 40 years. Um, I'm able to be a member of my community and have leadership and um, still be humble at home and be a grandma and crawl on the floor and be silly. And um, the gratitude piece can't be forgotten, but 
we all together can make the world a better place and women's brains and the way things, you know, get out there, try and believe in yourself. That's beautiful. And for my last question to round out our discussion, after everything you've gone through, all the hard work you've put in to reach this place in your life, in your career, what do you say is your most favorite, most rewarding um, part of your chosen profession? Again, as a healthcare provider, there's many STEM careers out there. Um, there's a sanctity, a preciousness to the relationship you have as a physician with a patient. And I never cease to respect and um, cherish that relationship that I could walk in and meet someone and tell them they have cancer. And two days later, I'm operating on them and cutting them open. And I think that that trust that bonds a physician and a patient, not only does it need to be respected and cherished, but those women tell me things they haven't told their spouse, their sisters or their mom sometimes. And I, I really, you know, I don't want to keep saying chair, but I, I find that um, something that need, I value highly and that very special relationship of helping people get better, hearing cancer, being scared, but knowing that there is a way to treat it and live a full life, um, as well as helping them through some very difficult times um, is something that, you know, I, is part of what keeps me going and makes me want to find a better way um, so I can have fewer of those difficult conversations uh, in the future. That's beautiful, Dr. Carlin. Thank you so much for joining me and for everything you've done for women and, you know, furthering our abilities to conquer great things. So thank you, Eva. And, and please go on and make this world a better place yourself. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And thank you guys for watching. Good luck on anything you choose to do. Thank you.